to it. But mm. something that's very interesting about the method of neuroscience, which is very interesting, David Papineau gave a brilliant argument. And his, I think you've mentioned about 50 people now. Yeah, sorry, but I, <laughs> let, 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 I'm going to pick up my notes. Let me just pick up my notes here, right. because this is uh, chapter two of a forthcoming book that me and Sabur Ahmed are writing called The Third Hypothesis. Wait a minute, there's a new book coming up. Yeah, it is, yeah. So okay. that's why I've done a lot of studies on this. This was based on my postgrad thesis as well. Okay, okay. Um, so basically, the David Papineau argument is really, really clever. So let me just give it to you. I do apologize, I'm going through these papers. No, it's going to look like a little mad. Uh, Mad philosopher here, but I do apologize. <coughs> you do philosophy? You can be refuted, my friend. <laughs> philosophy is fine, man. <laughs> Everyone does philosophy. If I'm going to be refuted, then my answer is this there is no such thing as a philosophy free refutation. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> oh! You know when they do that? When they, when they go, oh! Right? Yeah, I'm coming out like a child now, but it's, that's all my. That's not something they do, that's what they do at school, isn't it? Um, so yeah, so the limita- one of the limitations of neuroscience is this, and it's very, very interesting for everyone to actually understand this and transcend the kind of online hype that happens sometimes. Yeah. Okay, good. So, there's a variety of material candidates. Let me just okay. read it to you, one easier. So okay. David Pepineau, he postulates that neuroscience would not be able to target the material basis for conscious experience because when neuroscientists attempt to correlate neurochemical events in the brain with phenomenal experience, inner subjective experience, there would always be a number of different material properties. Say that part again, sorry. So, every time a neuroscience wants to correlate neurochemical events, happenings in the brain. So this goes back to our MRI example. Yes, so say you see the MRI or whatever you see, and you see neurochemical happenings in the brain, they want to correlate that with the subjective experience, the actual feeling, 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 or the whatever is being reported. There would, there would always be a number of different material properties which fit the evidence equally well. Okay. So he admits that neuroscientific research is able to narrow down, so neuroscience is really good and clever, and we love it as well as Muslims, is able to narrow down the physical brain events that correspond to conscious experience, correspond, correlate, not cause, but there would always be a variety of material candidates. And this is what he says. When we look for some material property common to all those cases where humans report they are phenomenally conscious, meaning subjective experience, and absence whenever they deny this, we will inevitably find a variety of material candidates which fit fit perfectly with the database. Apart from any strictly physical property, there would also be various structural properties. Now this is very, very, very interesting. What Papineau basically says here is that, well, you don't have a strong argument. You can't now say that the neurochemical event is identical with the conscious experience, okay? Mm-hmm. So here's the argument that he presents, and try and follow, it's a bit detailed logically, but I think you'll get it, yeah? Number one, a neurochemical event E is identical with a conscious experience P. E cannot be absent when P is testified to be Wait, present. So, 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 okay, so okay. Let me read it once and then we break it down. Okay. Yeah? So number one, a neurochemical event E is identical with a conscious experience P. Okay. Number two, E cannot be absent when P is testified to be present. Number three, E cannot be present when P is testified to be absent. Number four, E must be present to be necessary for P. Number five, E is sometimes absent when P is testified to be present. Number six, E is sometimes present when P is testified to be absent. Number seven, therefore, E is not necessary for P. So it's a very I brilliant think, argument. I think I see where, where this is going. Yes. Right. So let's break it down in very layman English. Yes, 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 So Papineau says this. So you have a neurochemical subjective experience going on, right? Say it's correlated to a subjective experience. So you have a neurochemical event happening. We see something firing. Yeah. And what neuroscience says, or some people that adopt a wrong approach to neuroscience, they say this neurochemical firing is identical with the conscious experience. Yes, okay. That's the main assumption yes. here. But he's saying, when you look at the massive database and all of these scans and, and neurochemical findings and happenings in the database... There's more than one candidate. There's lots of, yes, lots of, uh, more than one candidate. They can narrow down, but there's still more, more than one, one candidate, candidate, right? Yeah. That's the first issue. So yeah, so what he's saying here now is, now, the, the neurochemical events... Oh, I do apologize, my iPhone. Conscious experience of a computer. <laughs> it's talking by itself now. Okay. See, Siri on the iPhone watch is trying to prove internal conscious experience. Anyway, so a neurochemical event is identical to conscious experience. So what's happening in the brain, the assumption is, is that it's identical to the in, internal conscious experience. But then he breaks it down. Okay, 
So this would mean that the Nurukamuka event cannot be absent when someone is talking about the subjective conscious experience. Yeah. Because if it's the same, it can't be absent. Right, so he's, yes. well, hold on. So he's saying that if this thing is this thing, so, they, so they have to be both if, present. If the neurological firings represent the subjective experience, if the subjective experience is present where the neurological uh, p- uh, firing is not happening, then that would represent a contradiction. Yes, so yeah. So basically what he's saying is, you've got the neurochemical event happening, yeah. it can't be absent when the thing, when you're saying that neurochemical event is responsible for, for a certain subjective, subjective conscious experience. experience. Yes. So he said you, that they both have to be present basically, yeah? 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 Yes. So therefore, the neurochemical fi- uh, firings, right, have to be present to be necessary for the conscious experience. Yeah, yeah, of course. Because if it's causal, yes, yeah, if, you if, think, it's causal yeah. if you think this neurochemical finding is the it's conscious of it, the conscious experience, yeah. then the then so it has one to can't do without the other. Yes, so it has to be necessary. Yeah, it, has it has to be, to be present there. necessarily. But what so, he's but so, he, but, so yeah. basically you can't say that love is caused by this part of the brain unless it's always there when love is there. Absolutely. And yeah. yes, good. And also, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In a nutshell. So therefore, what he's seen in the database of neuro- neuro- neurobiological studies, he says, however, the, that thing that you're saying is causing love, that neurochemical pathway and those neurochemical happenings, yeah. they're sometimes absent when love is present, when ah, P is that's present. Like. That's really From, yes. Yeah. And then he says, also, at the same time, the neurochemical happening is sometimes present. When love, when love is absent. Ah, oh, that's it, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's so therefore he concludes, it's a brilliant argument, and I'll tell you the journal that it's from, it's called um, uh, David Papineau, Could There Be a Science of Consciousness, Philosophical Issues, Volume 13, 2003, pages 208 to 209. Do you know how powerful this is? Of course it is powerful, you know that's why I put it in, in let, my thesis. Let, let me put this in layman's time and tell me, correct me if I'm wrong. But let me just do the conclusion, Sorry. bro. Yeah, do this the is therefore, yeah, yeah. the neurochemical firings is not necessary for that wow. particular inner subjective conscious state. Do you know what you're saying? Let me tell you what you're saying, you correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. You're saying... What well, David think, Papineau is saying. Right, but generally you're making the argument using his yes. reference. What we're saying, or what you're saying more specifically, is... Love, hate, all the subjective experiences, you know, compassion, uh, going through any, even eating, like you said, a banana. Even pain, even right. pleasures pain, and pain tastes. And pleasure. yeah. All of that cannot be explained using neuro. No, 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 let's just calm down with your language. It can be explained, but... It doesn't, neuro, but okay, let me say that again. So you're saying that all of those things cannot be said to be caused by... Euro science. Yeah. Well, okay. This is let, let, yes. So I know what you're trying to say here. Right. Basically, what we're saying is yeah. that neuroscience cannot solve the hard problem, problem of, of consciousness. consciousness. It cannot tell us what is it like for Muhammad to have a banana on a Sunday morning. Yes. And it cannot say why that neurochemical, the why that subjective experience comes from or arises from neurobiological happenings or physical processes. Wow. That's the hard problem of consciousness. That's now you can you can never. This is my view. You can never even claim neuroscience can can answer the question. Why? The reason yeah. being yeah. is because the only thing that neuroscience can do. Let's look at it as a method. It's, it's a beautiful method. It's basically say that that physical happening is right. identical to that conscious experience. Yes. But you need to prove that. All right. you've seen is a neurochemical happening and a conscious experience. To say that they are identical now, given the fact that they are look so different feel so different, can be spoken about in different ways. One is first person, one is third person. Exactly. Right. In that way, you now need to prove that assumption you've made because it's not as a result of the data, it's your interpretation of the data because you have that philosophical assumption baggage that you're imposing on the data, which is, they are identical. But frankly, they are not identical. And that kind of... uh, Assumption is actually a philosophical assumption. That's why neuroscience wow. is not philosophically free. And I just want to really just iron this out. That I'm not just making this up. Can I right? just say one thing? And are you correct? Me yeah, of course. Honest? Yeah, I wanted to ask. Now put it this way, right? If science can only deal with falsifying material uh, material things, yeah. So science cannot because it has naturalistic presuppositions. Yes. So since science can only falsify that which is naturalistic. It cannot falsify that which is metaphysical. 
And therefore, to, to discount that which is metaphysical, whilst using only a naturalistic um, framework, is, is not possible. Look, there's no such thing as a metaphysics-free science anyway. Mm. Especially in your interpretations, because you have some assumptions that are first principles for you. Mm. And metaphysics is a wide field. Yeah. Metaphysics not only talks about like things like ontology, the nature and source of things, it talks about first principles. You have first principles in science all the time. Like a first principle of science is that you have to believe and assume but you can't that there are external um, metaphysical things under the microscope. I agree, but there's yeah. a lot of scientific things you can't put under the microscope. Yeah. Like when people think science is all about falsification, yeah, it's not true, yeah. read Popper. If you read the analysis of Popper, people have moved away from this kind of hard preparing stance of yeah. everything must be falsified. Here's a proof, and I let and it's a challenge to everybody. Go find there are the, go to any philosopher of science, any any scientist, and say, can you have a can you revive a falsified theory? Yes, you can. You just change the assumptions. Mm. Yeah, and here's an example. Right, so they believe in orbits, right? All the great data that we saw. And then what did they start finding? They saw the perturbations, the wobbly orbit of Uranus, mm. right? That is what they falsified the data, right? It's falsified. They're saying, oh, with orbits are not, you know, there's no orbits anymore. We have to change the way we understand celestial mechanics. They said, we're not going to do that. We've got so much good data. It's just been affirmed so well. Forget this thing that has basically gone against our, you know, theory. So what do they do? They just changed the assumption. They said, fine. There's another, another planet. There's another planet. Neptune. Right? And that's how they find Neptune. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's it. So it happens in science all the time. It's called epistemic holism, mm. right? That there is that kind of network of different uh, beliefs that have been affirmed. And some of them, you know, they're, they're all supported by each other. It's like this kind of coherentism going on in science. This, this very hardcore falsification, people don't use it anymore. Yes, it's useful, don't get me wrong. Mm. Uh, I read an essay on this. It has about, limitations. It has limitations, yeah. So I just want to just go back on um, basically neuroscience's assumptions just to really show that I'm not just making this up, right? Okay. Um, and it's very important for us to understand this. So the philosophical assumptions of neuroscience, okay? So take, for example, what, you know, moder Manzotti and Moderato, they highlight that neuroscience is not metaphysically innocent and that empirical data needs to be interpreted for, from the perspective of some premise, yeah? Rex Wilson, right? He also posits neuroscience explanation of consciousness is based on an assumption that phenomenal experience can be reduced to biology. Right, 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 so right. there's an assumption there. And that's why if, si if neuroscience claims they've solved the hard problem of consciousness, which I believe is nonsense, nonsense mm -hmm. especially from an ontological point of view, if they do claim, all they're doing is bringing their philosophical unproven assumption to the table, just like what Rex Wilson says, right? And he's, and he's a physicalist, right? Ian Gold and Adina Roskies, they explain that science is based on phys physicalist guiding assumptions which are taken from, from other fields and they're up for grabs, right? You have, I mean, you have so much. You have so many people. Like, uh, Ravoncio makes a really good point. He basically says, anti Ravoncio, if you want a really good summary of what I've been saying mm. in terms of the different philosophical approaches to, to the hard problem of consciousness, mm. read the book called Consciousness, The Science of Subjectivity by Anti Ravoncio. I think it was published in 2010. Really good book. And he even says that neuro neurobiological theories or neurobiological studies about consciousness, especially subjective consciousness, mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not philosophically innocent. They have, they're baggage. not philosophically free. They have philosophical baggage. And many of them, because of the nature of the science, they adopt what you call physicalism. Now, there are different types of physicalism, by the way. So and it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, let me, let me we can't me. do that today, though, bro. It's too long. All right. we could do is summarize try, try, try and put it in a nutshell. Hi, another video, bro. It's too long. Because yeah. you have things like reductive, reductive materialism yeah. or reductive eliminative physicalism, materialism. eliminative materialism. Yeah. You have functionalism. Yeah. You have emergent materialism, strong and weak emergent materialism. But all of them, I mean, you could summarize it. All of them have the same kind of they basic do, but I don't want to misrepresent academic discussions. Right, there, right, are, right. there are strong discussions going on. But yeah. generally speaking, and what yeah. I've read and my postgrad studies, they're not addressing the hard problem of consciousness. Yeah. Some people claim it's only an epistemic gap, like there is a gap in our knowledge. Yeah. Yes, there is a gap in our knowledge. We don't know how the physical stuff, you know, allows consciousness, subjective consciousness to exist, mm -hmm. right? Or to come into reality. Yeah. Yeah? We don't know that. And we don't know, and it's true, we don't know what it's like for Muhammad Higab to have a banana on a Sunday. Yeah. Or, you know, we don't know that. What it's like specifically for you. Or, I don't know what it's for me. I might know neurochemical pathways. I might understand your language, you don't know about your, the descriptions, person, but yeah. your first person in a subject experience, I don't know. So it's true, there is an epistemic gap, a knowledge gap. But I would go further, like many others, and I, even be, I believe Professor Nagel argues this as well, and many others. There is a ontological gap. It's metaphysics. It's a metaphysical question because the two things that you're talking about 
the source and nature of these things seem fundamentally so different. How can you even start to claim, right, mm. that neurochemical firings, yeah, mm. neurochemical firings are identical and equivalent to in a subjective conscious experience? Yeah. Surely, you know, it's the mark of a rational mind to question something that didn't have to be. And let's question this. Are you saying that it's just a knowledge gap? Here's the proof. Say you know everything at the, about the brain. Does it now follow you know his first person experience? Because science is all about third person. Do you see my point? The, no matter how much I know about the brain and physical processes, I will still not know what it's like for Muhammad Hijab to have a banana on a Sunday and to understand why they arise from physical processes. Mm -hmm. That is a metaphysical question. It's about ontology, metaphysics. It's a different kettle of fish. Hopefully, I know we haven't gone into it in detail, but hopefully we could discuss this at another time. Go for reductive materialism and limited materialism and all of these is and schism and functionism, which are very interesting as well. And I want to go more into, hopefully, back into the computational models as well. Yeah. Can a computer be rational? Because computers do deductive logic. Yeah. That's like an expression of rationality and consciousness. Does that mean computers can be conscious? And about artificial intelligence, and we've got some really good arguments about this, but that's mm. not the time.